Hello, and thank you for joining the final webinar of our three-part series for the insurance industry on discovering how to future-proof your company's marketing and profitability through digital adoption. My name is David Cooper. I'm marketing manager at Fountain, and I'll be your host today. This is the third session, and it will be focusing on how to track and keep improving performance from forecasting outcomes of your different channels to identifying exactly which ads lead to sales, then what experiments you need to put in place for further growth. Our first speaker is Gemma Russell, Senior Strategist at Fountain, who are a global award-winning digital marketing agency. Gemma has over 10 years in-house experience in digital marketing, and her experience managing complex campaigns has achieved success for numerous clients. Today, she'll be talking about forecasting, attribution, and optimization. Then our second speaker, as always, is Harry Ford, Head of Strategy at Kyan, an acclaimed digital development agency. Harry has strong, varied experience in digital as a digital product designer within the insurance sector, providing a product strategy at Kyan, and he will be speaking to you about growth, growing products with growth teams once the product is built. Uh, there's lots to cover today, so if you have any questions, do please enter them into the chat box to the right of the video screen, uh, ideally with the name of the person that you're directing the question to, and at the end, I'll be fielding these questions to our speakers. Uh, I hope you all enjoy and take away something useful, and now I'll hand over to Gemma from Fountain. Half of the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. We've all heard this 100-year-old adage many, many times, but if you're spending your marketing budget on generating high volumes of quotes, but you're not tracking which ones actually generate sales and revenue for your business, you could be falling into the same trap. Combined with the impact of COVID-19 accelerating digital transformation within the insurance industry, it's more important than ever to put the right steps in place to ensure that you're spending your marketing budget wisely. In today's webinar, I'll be providing some actionable takeaways to enable you to discover three things. So firstly, effectively forecasting results to take the risk out of digital marketing. Secondly, attributing and measuring ROI within your digital marketing campaigns. And thirdly, what to optimise to continually improve results from your campaigns. So to demonstrate how crucial taking the time to accurately forecast the expected outcomes of your activities, it's important to understand where, where we are now, so what the current state of affairs is. So firstly, over 60% of marketers say that their customer acquisition cost has increased in the past three years. Now this underlines the increasing challenges that industries such as insurance face in an increasingly price sensitive market. Only 35% of marketers said that understanding the ROI of their campaigns is either very important or extremely important. Now that highlights the existing disconnect between your business objectives and your marketing goals, which is obviously really, really interesting. Now 52% of marketers are currently using attribution reporting. Now this shows that only half of marketers have realized the importance of understanding and interpreting the role that each marketing channel plays in the customer journey. And lastly, 67% uh, of companies use lead generation as the sole metric to determine success. Now obviously, rather than looking beyond this to actually look at which leads are most profitable and therefore how can you find more of them? Now that we understand that landscape a little bit better, I'm going to dig into the details, starting with part one, which is forecasting. Now, how do you forecast outcomes from digital marketing channels to minimise the risk of wasted marketing spend? Well, the first thing would be to start with the end in mind. What are your goals? How much revenue and how many sales do you need from this campaign? What return on investment, so ROI, would make this worth your while? Take into account your average customer acquisition cost and the lifetime value of a customer when calculating this. So make sure, as we mentioned obviously in the stat earlier, make sure that your goals, uh, your marketing goals specifically, are aligned to your overall business objectives. Now moving on, the next part of this is data accuracy. So how accurate is the quote sales and revenue data within your CRM analytics and ad platforms? 
what constitutes a quote or a lead and are all the important actions that take place on your website being measured effectively? Now that's phone calls, contact us completions, etc. Now, understanding all of those things will give you a fundamental understanding of how accurate your existing data is and if any changes need to be made. It probably goes without saying, but are, if there are any issues that you find at this stage, do try and rectify them, as obviously you might already be wasting marketing spend if your measurement isn't up to scratch. Now, moving on to digital marketing channels. In yesterday's webinar, David Cooper gave us a really clear overview of the available digital marketing channels and their role within the customer journey. Leading on from this and with your campaign goals in mind, in order to forecast, there are some key things that you need to know and need to determine. The first one would be how big is your target audience? So on platforms like social platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook, for example, you're probably going to find the answer to that question a little bit easier. Um, secondly, you'd need to look at things like the number of available searches and impressions. So if you're looking at activity such as uh, paid search or display activity or video activity, you'd probably be looking at metrics such as that instead. Um, the next thing is that you need to look at the average click through rate and the average cost per click. You can either get those from the ad platforms themselves or alternatively find insurance industry benchmarks, for example, for LinkedIn, we'd probably be looking at a click-through rate of around 0.5%. And CPCs will vary from about six to 10 pounds, something like that. And that depends on the seniority, uh, usually of the people that you're targeting. For example, and other sort of various factors. Um, compared to Facebook, it's a very, very different landscape. So um, the click-through rate is on average about one and a half, two percent 2%, something like that. And the CPC is one pound fifty. So you're not um, each platform has their own nuances and, and will will differ a little bit. So it's worth bearing that in mind when you're forecasting as well. And lastly, um, conversion rates. So obviously think about click to quote conversion rate and quote to sale or alternatively, um, depending on how you measure your sort of quote to sale, uh, you might be looking at marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads and then sales. It, you know, it depends how you're measuring that. Um, obviously, once you have all of this data, bring it all together and then calculate the expected returns from each of those channels. Now, don't forget to include remarketing because obviously that is crucial. And it's important to think about the relationship between all of the channels. So just for example, you might find that your new customers may first hear about you on social media, but then go on to make a sale when clicking on an ad in Google search results, for example. So it does it can get a little bit complex but fundamentally having all of that information and thinking about all of those things will help you to build an accurate forecast so moving on we're going to now move on to part two so now that we've covered forecasting we're going to have a look at attribution and measurement so how do you attribute and measure roi within your ad platforms effectively so attribution methods is where we'll start so many companies not just insurance companies, measure their activity on a last click basis. Now this shows which ad a customer last clicked on or engaged on, uh, or engaged with, sorry, prior to their purchase. Now, while this does give us some insight into where a customer ultimately converted, what it doesn't do is it doesn't take into account all the other touch points in the customer journey. So as time has gone on and as the industry um, has become more and more competitive, obviously user journeys have become increasingly complex. So once upon a time, it was pro probably fairly simple. Someone searched for insurance, clicked on a paid search ad, and then maybe ultimately converted directly on your website. Obviously now, what's probably likely to happen is maybe someone sees an ad on paid social media, they might see a display ad, they might then search and click on you know, an organic result, and then they might end up clicking on a paid ad, and then you're remarketing to, to them, sorry, and then you might end up being picked up by a remarketing ad. It's, it's obviously, there are still users that have a much shorter, simpler user journey, but you know, unfortunately, it is becoming more and more likely that these conversion paths are becoming longer and longer. This is why attribution modelling, which is available in platforms such as Google Analytics, for example, um, you, need, you can use those to measure which method is most likely to deliver a higher volume of profitable customers. So attribution modelling can help you to understand which ad platforms, keywords and audiences play which role in your customer journey. 
it helps you determine where customers find you. So the first touch point, for example, and which channels tend to assist a conversion, but not ultimately convert. So what I mean by that is there might be channels that sit somewhere in the middle of that customer journey. Um, and they obviously play an important role, but they're not ultimately where somebody converts. And obviously also understanding the last touch point for a customer before they convert. So really understanding all of those elements will help you to build an attribution model that will then help you to replicate that and find more, find more valuable customers. So now that we've talked about attribution methods, we can move on to another topic, which is offline conversion tracking. Now, that probably sounds a little bit scarier than it actually is, but fundamentally, in recent years, there's been a number of advancements within certain ads and analytics platforms so that you can merge your offline sales data with the performance of your digital marketing campaigns. So if the sale takes place offline, it ensures that that data is being pulled into the relevant ad platform. So obviously, I guess if you think about it in two ways, that obviously you might find that a lot of your sales in insurance will take place online. So actually it's relatively simple to get that data into your campaigns. You can measure which campaigns and which keywords and audiences are generating activity. However, it's also likely and common that in insurance, a lot of sales do still take place over the phone. And the question is, how do you get those sales into, into your ad platforms to truly understand and measure the impact of the activity that you're running? So, as I said, one of the biggest challenges you'll probably face in that instance is actually being able to understand at a keyword audience or ad level, which of those move from quote and slash lead to, to actually to a sale. And then obviously actually maximizing lifetime value, which is of course, um, not just getting customers, but keeping them as well is obviously sort of really, really important. So to get a full understanding of where those valuable customers are, com customers are coming from, you can sync all of that lead quote data and all of that sales data into your ad platforms and analytics along with those offline sales and revenue data. Now, Google Ads is a really great place to start because it integrates with the big players in the CRM industry like Salesforce and HubSpot, for example. So usually custom integrations are also possible. So if you don't use those CRMs, obviously there's plenty of plenty of other ones that you uh, might be using. Um, obviously, all you really need to do is create the relevant stages in the custom in the in that journey um, in the ad platforms as well as sales, and ideally assign a relative value to your business, and that helps the ad platform to understand which goal types are more valuable. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, offline conversion tracking can also be set up within Google Analytics, so you can actually see that data, not just across your Google Ads campaigns, but across other platforms as well. So for example, organic search and direct and whatnot. And Facebook Ads does actually also support syncing of offline data. This does seem to be the way that the industry is going, so I would expect that over time, more and more ad platforms will support that as well. Now, if you can move towards doing this, this will help you truly measure the impact of your campaigns even when a customer starts their journey online, but completes it offline. Now, the last part of this, now that we've talked about this, is actually optimization. So what to optimize to continually improve results from your campaigns? So firstly, we'll start with quality, not quantity. So when assessing the effectiveness of your digital marketing campaigns, it's really easy to fall into that lead volume cost per lead trap. If you've got lots of leads with a lower than forecasted cost per lead, right now, you're probably rubbing your hands together. But the best piece of advice that I can give you is to look beyond top level lead volumes and cost per lead. Are those leads actually good quality? Are they more or less likely to lead to a, to a sale? What's the lifetime value of those leads? With all of those nifty offline data imports that obviously you're now going to try after listening to this, the data to make optimization and budget allocation decisions will be based on what is actually, actually influencing your bottom line results. If you couple this with attribution modeling, you're onto a winner. So moving on, focus on customer retention and churn. Now, of course, in the insurance in industry, actually retaining customers and reducing churn is really, really important. So employing strategies which don't just focus on getting new prospects, 
but reminding your existing customers of your business's unique selling points and why they should stay with you to build loyalty. One of those tactics could be, for example, is actually speaking to your sales team. What are the common objections? What are the common reasons that people choose not to use you? And then try and overcome those objections in the ads and the messaging that you're using um, if you're looking for a specific sort of retention or churn strategy. So something like that can work really, really well. And then moving on to the next part of optimization, I suppose the latest innovation from Google is called value based bidding. Now, that is basically in line. This is in line with what we've been talking about. So it's with the ad platforms becoming more algorithmically led. It's the inputs that control the outcome. So, for example, the audiences that you're targeting, the placements that you're appearing on, the keywords that you're using and the ads, copy, messaging and imagery. Now, the downside to that is that outside of the e-commerce business, where obviously all sales take place online, Sometimes ad platforms will struggle to understand which conversion types are more valuable to your business. So, for example, a phone call might only be worth £10 to your business, but a quote is worth £200. Well, Google doesn't understand that. So it's going to optimise your campaigns for lead volume rather than quality. So it might well lead to an increase in phone calls rather than quotes because it's easier to get them. Now, Value-based bidding, what it does is it enables you to assign a value to a conversion. This is applicable to both lead types and offline conversions. So what it will do is it allows your campaigns to focus on finding more valuable customers, focusing on the value that it provides your business rather than the volume. So to conclude, start with the end in mind and align your business objectives with your marketing goals. Check the accuracy of your data collection before you embark on any forecasting exercise and you'll be set up for success. Make sure that you take the time to understand your most valuable customer journeys and set up offline conversion tracking to get a true understanding of this. Remember to focus on the quality, not the quantity of leads. And digital marketing isn't just about customer acquisition, but improving retention and loyalty while reducing churn. Because, of course, marketing is too important to be left to the marketing department. Now, back to you, David. Thank you very much, Gemma. Yeah, some great insights there and really interesting data as well. Um, so up next, uh, as always, we've now got Harry. So, Harry, I'll pass over to you now. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, so today what I'm going to be speaking about is <clears throat> growing your products with growth teams. So uh, my name is Harry Ford and I am the head of product strategy at Kyan. Um, one of the things I'm heavily involved in in Kyan is the growth of products. So at the start of projects, we will set goals, KPIs, strategic north stars uh, that we want to try and achieve. And I'm going to walk us through why it's important that we, we install these things, uh, like such as a growth mindset, uh, workshops, uh, into our process really and our teams. So to give you a little more background around how we fit growth and growth workshops into our process, um, what we do is we run design sprints at the beginning of a lot of our projects, as I spoke about um, in, in my first talk. This is to validate the idea itself. Once the MVP has been validated, we will roll into uh, what we call production sprints and build. Ongoing with our clients, we run monthly and quarterly growth workshops. This is to make sure that we are constantly kind of innovating the product and improving where we need to. Uh, you run growth hacking once you know that you actually have a good market fit and your customers value the products that they have. Growth is something that all businesses need and look to achieve at some point. Businesses at the moment are obviously looking to pivot more their business models and change up what they're trying to do to provide a service still uh, to the customers, but also to help them try and survive a lot of the time. But when all of this is over and sort of normality is starting to show already and it starts normality starts to resume, um, these new business models won't just disappear. They won't go away. They will now be here forever. And the ones that we look to improve and grow them upon uh, will probably do better uh, in, in sort of similar events in the future. To give you a little context around what we do within a growth workshop session, it's quite a short session, only lasts about just over half a day four hours, uh, I thought I'd run over at top level. 
so first what we do as a group um, we identify the problems we want to solve uh, around whatever chosen topic that we're, we're focusing upon we, we think about how we can get these problems unstuck we start to think a little bit creatively uh, we prioritize so which ideas we like the most and what fit between what part of the business is this acquisition or retention or whatever part of the business we think this affects we then design out in the in the workshop itself we start to design out little experiments uh, looking at other places as well for inspiration like this company does this or this place does this uh, and then afterwards after the workshop we then have a period where we can learn from these experiments and tests and see which ones are actually doing us uh, uh, either giving back the numbers or whatever we need to, you know, or, or bringing in some more um, acquisition type pieces. Combining sort of our workshop know-how that we have now and a growth hacking mindset, we've created a, a business growth workshop overall that can help businesses growth once you've launched a product. Growth hacking is a process of simply, it's, it's rapid experimentation across marketing, product and sales. Um, it can include other areas of the business as well to help identify the most efficient ways, really, to help you grow a business. The book, which I originally sort of designed the workshop through, is Hacking Growth. It's written by Sean Ellis. It provides probably the definitive playbook in sort of running growth experiments. In the book, Ellis sets out uh, that growth doesn't just come from sort of the top of a funnel, but anywhere within your customer's journey and life cycle. It's, for instance, ensuring that customers repeat or recur is just as important if not more so than than getting new customers into the top of your funnel the critical part i think of growth hacking is to run these small experiments with stated sort of hypothesis and and make sure we define success criteria so we can quickly learn if we are either on the right track or whether we need to try something maybe a bit different any company owner uh, will, will tell you now that growing a small company or into a big company isn't easy. Online businesses may present a host of new problems now, but the internet also gives us a unprecedented amount of data, not to mention the ability to now be able to communicate with our customers in so many different ways than, than before. So these opportunities to test your product and learn from customers are always two of the key factors in, in hacking growth. They provide a systemat systematic way of collecting and then analyze, looking and testing your data that just about any business can quickly, you know, really make the most of, um, especially within its time and, and resources. So a common scenario that a, a huge small business owners and new business owners and, you know, new product launches, what they face is, you know, you're, you're a CEO or a small business or a, a project lead. I know you're, you're making a nice profit. You tried to make it's go. You want. You always want it to go to that next level. Um, what you need to do is prioritize growth, really, by establishing what we like to do is a growth team. So growth teams are made up from lots of different departments within the company. This allows you to harness the collaborative team efforts in order to find ways to grow that you usually wouldn't be able to find. First, I should talk about why, why we create a growth team in the first place. We know that a lot of companies have folks with normal or formal sort of growth teams or people that like to do this and informal ones you know they may be a growth pm uh, it may be more of your marketing team that focuses on this or maybe sales when when you look at the sort of cross section of companies in the industry many of these newest b2b or consumer facing companies have all built growth teams we've also heard now we we I hear it all the time but many boards now ask their ceos to invest in growth teams um, but why did this even emerge, really? Looking over this, the product death cycle is a bit of a depressing slide. But unfortunately, this is how products uh, are often shipped, really, and released. You have someone with a, an idea or a vision, I guess, who builds some features, uh, and then we do a launch. They might get an initial spike of traction from this, but then when growth flattens, it's not clear where to go next or where to take things. They... What we tend to do is we talk to some customers, we ask what they want, and then we're going to try again. Uh, we then add a few more features, we relaunch, and then the cycle goes on and on. And we do that too many, too, too many times, and all of a sudden, you know, the company's dead. Why is this, though? So if you've ever, created, if you've ever seen this movie, uh, Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner, 
Uh, in, in the movie, his character says, if you build it, they will come. This may have worked for his character when he built a baseball field in the middle of nowhere, but such advice, really, and this sort of mantra, which is pushed, uh, can prove, I think, quite disastrous, really, for new businesses and startups. So if you build it, they may not actually come, it turns out. Better products and more features do not necessarily equal growth. So many of their key levers for driving you know, more user acquisition or retention and engagement could sometimes sit outside uh, the toolkit for most great product leaders. Um, there is a long list of skills that I think are really critical but not often considered core to a product. Things like tech integrations, sign up funnel, you know, A-B testing, testing product points, things like this. Occasionally there are people who know all of this, but they tend to be very rare, I find. Furthermore, like I don't think no one individual can drive this whole thing. Instead, you need to bake really this into your organizational, you know, the goals and the, the DNA that you have. You need to collect these efforts within a larger framework of your company and look further than just your product teams. Thus lead into sort of the best collaboration and innovation. So what do we do is to really we want to seek out and build a framework for growth that works within our company or and structure and, and your team. We've come to see that design thinking and agile uh, are their own systems of sort of structure, organizational structure, you know, workflows, they are philosophies now and skill sets. Uh, they are key to how we work within a company. In the same way, I think we, we can build growth teams as a system too. So product growth really is it is a discipline of applying like scientific methodology to, to business KPIs. It provides a, a real cool underlying system for increasing metrics, whether it's revenue, retention or acquisition, engagement, or any other sort of core business metric. Uh, and just as you expect with a scientific method, the steps are built on understanding the business and, and that the business is data then creating a hypothesis from this that we can identify why certain processes are actually happening as they are and prioritizing those ideas and then enabling us to run quick experiments and then repeat this cycle. That way, if you take your active user count, maybe uh, if your active user count is low, you can look and analyze your data that you have to understand that you need more top of the funnel user acquisition. And then think around and hypothesize that a combo of you know paid advertising referrals can really help at that point and then execute against that. That is much, I think, much better than more targeted than just building more features that your users are asking for. So and then expecting you know growth to kind of magically increase as a result. So just talk a little bit around, around how we set up a growth team. Uh, with us at Kayan, what we try and bring in. It, many different people from different skill sets uh, across the company to be involved. Uh, this also helps us understanding across the company of what we're doing and the importance of growth, obviously, but also starts to build a bit of a growth culture. You need many different functional roles, I think, to help this from product, but obviously marketing as well, engineer, you know, sales, data is very important. You know, finance could be involved. You can combine all of these people into individual teams or maybe a team and organization that can, you know, bring in itself, just start to build little growth teams. Like some examples here I'll quickly run through, like a growth PM. So a product manager that can, is more responsible for the experiment and the roadmap of what this experiment is, is going to be doing. You know, an engineer. So an engineer who's focused maybe just more on technical decisions and implementing just experiments. A growth marketer. So a versatile marketer with an expertise maybe more in giving in any given channel particularly, but from more from paid advertising to SEO to email and others like this. Growth data. So an analyst focused on creating insights, you know, both more macro on a user's lifestyle um, and micro as well. So on exp uh, specific experiments. And then importantly, we can bring in designers to this. So a designer leading the, the UX, the user experience, but maybe with, I find with these sort of things, it's more of an emphasis on speed. So we can create things really quickly and then get them out and test them. Ultimately, I think the goal is to define 
the problem based on your team's sort of initial insights and hypothesis, and then the team will try and solve that particular problem. Uh, in order for your, your team, your growth team to work and succeed, you need uh, a very strong leader at the helm. It needs to be someone that can unite this, you know, multidisciplinary team and, and keep them all on course for improvement. The leader can also help identify a target area. They can help set their clear goals and establish maybe the time frame that suits them to accomplish these goals. Also, they need to kind of one of the big pains is to keep the team together, helping them stay clear of distractions and people pulling them away, the interruptions that we always get. And the leader needs to maybe also, I find, recognize which ideas might sound more fun and exciting and we're sort of levitating towards, but they don't solve the actual goal and need that we've, we've sort of focused on at the start. So they can put things on the back burner if they want. They have that stamp of authority. If core product teams have you know, normal engineers, designers, PMs, and so do growth teams, so what's the difference between these? I think it's all dependent on what they actually do. So product teams focus much more on creating core value, enhancing, you know, product market fit over a time. This means for them, it means sort of obsessing, I think, over like every little interaction in a core engagement. Um, it's a game more of, you know, pixels and inches, uh, and they, they all count. But on the other hand, growth teams, I think, should focus on getting this core value out there into the world. So getting as many folks as possible to experience and experience the, that value that we've kind of set and help improve upon that value. So to develop a, a must-have product, you need to know your customers. I think you need to know them really well. Like you, you've got to have your head screwed on and get to know them really well. There are countless entrepreneurs trying to come up with and be you know, the next Airbnb or Netflix or Amazon. Uh, each of these companies, I think, also obviously experience sort of rapid growth. And that's probably because they all have something in common. That They all released a, a must-have product or service that people really love. Even if you're sure that people love your product, you have to get a grasp on your customers' opinions. So a great way, a simple way of doing this is by reaching out to them. Um, only then you're really going to know if your product is a, a must-have one. You can run, so what I've done a couple, a few times recently is you run a must-have survey with your customers. It's like super simple and reliable, and uh, it finds out how many of your customers you know, feel about your, or how your customers feel about your product. Uh, all it takes is to ask a few, you know, you can ask just a few hundred customers a single sort of multiple choice question here. Um, the question is, uh, how disappointed would you actually be if this product no longer existed tomorrow? And the three possible answers are, A, very disappointed, B, somewhat disappointed, or, or B, sorry, somewhat disappointed, and C, not disappointed at all. Um, you can be confident if at least around 40% of your customers choose very disappointed. And once you reach that milestone, you're in this sort of perfect position to use this sort of growth hacking technique that you, that you want to be able to push forward and go ahead with. However, if it's below that 40%, then you have to continue to kind of improve and develop on your product. Um, if this is the case, like I always see people go, oh, oh, as in there's no panic. There is there are so many affordable ways to be able to do this now and communicate that your, your product's core values you know, like things like A-B testing. You can gain really crucial insights now by running really fast prototype validation or, or showing test audiences maybe just a simple video demonstration. Even if these tests come back, not all that successful, the feedback that you're going to gather um, is going to be invaluable and it's going to help you push into, that, into the correct um, direction. One of the best ways to drive traffic to a service or your product is working out which metrics matter uh, most to generate growth? Standard metrics for web growth and online business are metrics like you know web traffic, user acquisition, returning users to your website. Your business may have specific metrics that are more maybe uniquely relevant to your growth. It's important to identify these unique core metrics as soon as possible for you. A risk of not doing so is that we may find ourselves drowning in data maybe and, and distracted by what not matter, what doesn't matter. 
To find out what specific metrics you need, you can ask yourself, like again, to ask yourself a simple question. Which of my customer actions can be measured to reveal how positive their experience uh, with my product is? So let's take, for example, Facebook. Their core metrics are how frequently users log in, how much time they spend on the site, how active they are in creating posts and comments, and how many friend requests are being sent out. So since Facebook's revenue is based on selling ad space, these are all important metrics for them to show how many people are on the site and how engaged these people are. What we really need by doing this process is to eventually identify what the one key metric is to define as your kind of North Star. Your North Star is that one metric above all of these that best measures the core value, I think, that you're delivering in your product. Uh, this measurement will try and uh, people can focus around this and it will keep their team focused on growth um, and make sure time and resources are there for them as well. Facebook's North Star, I think, is the, well, it definitely is the number of daily active users because it, above all, for them, gives them a better indication of what Facebook's growth actually is. In our growth workshops, we tend to focus a lot on three of the most important growth metrics. Uh, the three growth levers that we, we focus on here are acquisition, activation, and retention. As I said before, there are other levers that you can focus on, i.e. engagement, reactivation, but we find as a default to start with, these are the best three to cover. Uh, and we obviously, with our clients at the beginning, we tend to tweak these uh, to suit. Acquisition is, you know, how do your potential customers find out about you? How do they find you? And how do they actually get in touch? Activation is how do you turn these customers, or your potential customers, into paying customers or users? Uh, and what's your you know conversion rate? Uh, and retention, how do you keep your customers coming back? How do you keep them rebooking? How do you increase their, their lifetime value? The more loyal customers you have, the higher your profits. In fact, there's a study by Baines and Company, um, and it's shown that even a 5% increase in customer retention can lead to an increase in profits of between 25% and 95%. This is what we're talking around here is the, the power of habit formation. And this applies, it really applies to growth hacking at this point. Many businesses find success by helping customers form habits, by offering you know, rewards, uh, by a process known as this, this engagement loop. Amazon, I'm going to use as an example, does this really well with Prime uh, being an, an amazing engagement loop. Uh, the company makes an offer. They reward customers for taking it and then provides an excellent service, keeping their customers sort of happy uh, and coming back again for more. So Amazon makes the offer of you know prime membership either through an advertisement, or an email, TV, uh, leading to then customer signups. Next is to reward the customer for taking the offer by signing up to prime and get all of these benefits for you know, you get loads of benefits like live streaming of TV shows and movies and free one day shipping. Uh, they then reassure customers by telling a customer how much you've actually saved at the end of each purchase. So they, they you know, it's a real reward right at the end and a reminder. These rewards kind of for a customer, they feel amazing and it doesn't take much usage for customers to start this, this retention cycle of coming back. Prime have been so successful uh, successful uh, that they even surpassed when they've done this and they've even surpassed you know Amazon's expectations each year they have more of a uh, I think they have more than 90% of prime subscribers renew their memberships a good way to start your own engagement loop is to test different reward strategies I found uh, in order to find you know what customers value the most two of the most common types are social recognition and user achievements for example Using an example like Instagram or TikTok, you know, it gives you social recognition with likes. And the reward is that you have this non-stop dynamic content. You know, you get a, a hit every time you come. There's fresh content every time you log in. Uh, we're kind of addicted to it as humans without even knowing. This dynamic, ever-changing reward releases pheromones within us and keeps us coming back each time for more. Fitbit is a really good example of best user achievements. 
So if you send, uh, you know, they send you a congratulatory alert when the user takes 10,000 steps or you hit a, a record runtime, which I've never done. <laughs> um, so rounding up, really, uh, things are why we use growth workshops. They are a proven and effective sort of growth strategy that can be adopted by companies. Uh, we found of any size in any field. Um, their, their main key tenants are the cross-functional teams, uh, rigorous data collection and analysis. And then third and most importantly is that, that rapid experimentation and testing these experiments and learning from them. So what I see a lot of companies worry about at this point is if I set up a team, what if they come up with is just crap or wrong or are they wasting time and resources? I, the rest of it here is that you need to have a safe space within organizations to allow teams to thrive and to create. It is better to build something and get it out there to test and analyze than build nothing at all, which is what we'd do if we, you know, if we try and be absolutely perfect with everything that we create. Uh, we back in the days of you know waterfall because we're we're being such perfectionists about our visions. Ultimately, products are only good if people actually want to use them and for you to know this more than the customer themselves. So hopefully that's given you a good overview. Um, inside why we should run in growth workshops and you know to start maybe thinking about setting up growth teams within your own businesses. So thank you for listening. I'm gonna pass back to David. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much, Harry. Yeah, very valuable as always. Um, so now that we've had the two uh, presentations then, what we're gonna do is just run through some pre-submitted questions. And remember if you do have any more, uh, add them to the chat box. <clears throat> so uh, Gemma, Going back to your, your strategy of this, this forecasting attribution optimization, mm -hmm. are there any examples um, of, of clients where you've done this in the past, taken this approach, and what were the results? Yes, so um, it was a, I have to be honest, it's company that isn't in, or best example I can think of, isn't in the insurance industry itself, but kind of similar. Uh, so in uh, SaaS, um, so sort of similar theory where a lot of the, the final sale takes place offline and there was a real disconnect between the data that we had um, in the ad platforms versus what was actually happening in terms of sales and revenue. So one of the first steps we took was actually doing what we talked about there. So actually the offline conversion tracking, um, so sorting that out, making sure that that was all synced in so we could see all of the different stages of the sale, both in the ad platforms and in analytics. What that actually allowed us to do um, was not just to improve the performance of the ad campaigns and focus on lead quality. So um, we've actually increased the average uh, order value by about sort of 25, 30% in the space of about 12 months. So it's quite a significant shift for them by, by being able to focus our optimization on that. And also, we also did some additional um, conversion rate optimization work for them. So as a result of being able to see which, rather than just focusing on the conversion rate itself, but actually focusing on um, the lead to, or the click to sort of MQL, so marketing qualified lead rate, we actually managed to increase that by, again, around or 50 percent over 12 months it's quite a significant increase so both of those things meant more more for the client but also more profitable leads and sales for the for the client so that's probably the the best example from kind of start all the way to end but certainly this is an increasing uh, increasingly used tactic with our clients so it, it's becoming more and more utilized and obviously it, more and more valuable so Brilliant. yeah and i guess kind of as a follow-up question is it uh is it difficult to, to actually implement this kind of conversion tracking? Um, to be honest with you, in uh, in the ad platforms itself, no. Um, it's relatively straightforward. If you think about it, it can be as simple as just a literally a spreadsheet upload, like a CSV upload, if you wanted it to be. So it can be really, really simple. The, the tricky one, if I'm honest, can be uh, analytics syncing with that kind of data. But you know, even if I, all you can achieve at the moment is doing it within the ad platforms, that in itself is incredibly valuable. So um, I think that, yeah, analytics might be another step, depending on which platform you use, of course, because there's, you know, see Adobe and Matomo and various other options as well. So, um, yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. And Harry, question for you. Um, what growth experiments have you run recently and what types of projects were they for? Yeah, um, one we ran... We, we, one of the best things that we do is actually we run them internally at Cayenne. So we we run them for our own 
products. So we have obviously events and we have our own website and we have lots of different things like this and teams and things that we need to improve uh, our growth on. So events, we want to get more people to our events and, and our website, we might just want to get more people in and get direct leads from our website. So these are things that we can run simple experiments without changing a whole website and doing too much. We run, uh, for example, we did a, um, an event, uh, we needed more people to come to our online events because you know over the last year there's more online events. We want to make them different. We want to do different things. Um, you know, like this collaborating with you guys, it's a really good idea to be able to bring different perspectives of of the business and marketing funnel and everything. Um, one thing that I'm doing at the moment to kind of give a broader scope to you know growth and it's not just digital. You know, it's I started my own little startup at the beginning of last year called Little Trips. It's a, it's a digital application, travel application. And what I'm trying to do is trying to grow the awareness of my product through different marketing funnels and different ideas. So one of the ideas is obviously it's through Google. One of the best things I can do at the moment is do Google ads and promote my blog and things like this. But also it's ideas like I've got a van and I've, I've signed my, my van and I'm now doing a trip around the country to as an experiment to kind of gain some insight and around the brand itself and try and gain, you know, so I've got a URL there and that's just a test. It may not work, <laughs> but I'm going to try it out for a, for a few weeks and drive around to different villages and try and promote and do letter drops and things like this. So there's lots of different experiments I've found that you can run, uh, not only online, but obviously there's lots of offline as well that you can, you can really, there's a lot of cool things you can do within that. Brilliant. And and on the on growth teams as well, like if there are people watching that are really behind it but are struggling to kind of get that buy-in from the people making the decisions, are there any sort of tips you have or like handy piece of advice for people actually being able to sell it internally? Yeah, it's a good question. There's again, it's kind of similar to when people ask for other workshops and things. I think sometimes it's the simplest way I've found to be able to push this in is get someone who does these you know like us a kind to be able to just run a workshop very quickly even if it's not a workshop and it's just a talk and showing the benefits of doing these things because if you do focus on the benefits uh, of running these and you can see them like we can prove that you know we're working with companies like motorpoint at the moment and we want to increase the you know the the traffic on their website and bring that up to a different level and there's lots of things that we're doing through and we want to build bring in experiments the whole time and, and to show how easy they are. Like, I think people are worried about, you know, like they're gonna be like projects. They're really not, you know, you can write down experiments into a Google sheet and have four at the end of a workshop and say, right, let's test these two out of these four and see which one brings back the most benefit. Maybe that's an ad campaign, maybe it's a Facebook campaign or, you know, a blog campaign or whatever it is, you know, lots of different ideas. And then test those and bring them back. And you can do that really quickly. You know, and it's it doesn't have to be a particular skill to do that. It can just be this multiple uh, uh, disciplinary team that can help maybe take, you know, take uh, someone in the marketing might want to take responsibility for one. Someone on the development team might want to change up buttons on the website and take responsibility for that. So you can kind of spread the the um, the wealth there really as as the projects go. Experiment. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And that's all we've got time for. So thank you uh, to both of our speakers, Gemma and Harry, and of course, to the audience. I hope everyone took away some valuable actions and insights from this. If you would like to talk to our speakers or ask them any questions that weren't answered, then please feel free to contact them on LinkedIn or reach Gemma at gemma.russell at fountainpartnership.co.uk or harry at harry at kyan.com. Now, I hope this series has been helpful and added value to your digital adoption plans and giving you some practical advice maybe to achieving success through digital channels. Uh, all the best, stay safe, and bye for now. Bye.